Good morning, everyone. It's wonderful to see you all here today. Uh, I guess most of you noticed that uh, Ez called me his assistant a little bit earlier in the service. Um, I'm actually heading off on long service leave uh, for five weeks, so he might be making a move while I'm away. Can you just keep an eye on him and text me if uh, anything untoward happens and I end up coming back as his assistant? Uh, friend, uh, it'd be great if you keep your Bibles open to that part of God's Word. And uh, there's um, uh, an outline. Well, there, actually, there is no outline. Uh, there's a piece of paper there if you're happy to take notes. Uh, this week, I, I was reading an article about how to survive a lion attack. And uh, I'm not sure many of us here in this building this morning will have given much thought about how would I ever survive a lion attack, given that, you know, really, all the lions in Australia are really safely in cages. But just in case, just in case, a lion escapes from the Stardust Circus and is roaming down Macquarie Mall late one evening and you are the only person in the mall and you see the lion and the lion sees you, what do you think you should do? Most of us, I think, would instinctively run. But if you want to survive a lion attack, the advice is actually, don't run. Why? Well, the reason is quite simple. Usain Bolt, the fastest human ever to live, can run at 44 kilometres an hour, and a lion can run at 80 kilometres an hour. So if you're going to run, you're only going to be exhausted by the time the lion actually catches you, drags you to the ground and kills you. The... the, the article is amazing. It actually encourages that you need to stand your ground and then you need to try and figure out what the lion wants. <laughs> How many of you think you could do that? Apparently, if the, the, ta- uh, the tail of the uh, lion is swishing backwards and forth, it actually means that they're feeling a bit threatened themselves. So that's a good thing. But if their tail is still, then it's stalking you. And quite frankly, you're in big trouble. But still, do not run, okay? And don't even bother trying to climb a tree. There is a reason why they are a top predator. They can climb trees as well. You are to stand your ground. This article actually goes on to say, should the lion charge you, you still must not run. This will obviously be difficult. (laughs) No kidding. So why am I talking to you about uh, surviving a lion attack? Well, it's actually because the advice given here is not unlike the instruction that Peter gives as he concludes this letter. Uh, In this closing section of uh, this letter, here Peter is focusing on the sort of relationships that need to exist within the church that will help us to face opposition and hostility. What should our fellowship be like in order to withstand that? And in our passage, Peter clearly identifies the unseen enemy who stands behind the sort of everyday opposition and hostility that are faced by Christian brothers and sisters as the devil, who prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. And the devil devours people through uh, opposition and hostility they face when that person, when the Christian person panics and they give up. That's when they're devoured. Uh, The other instruction that Peter actually has here is, is Peter gives us the instruction to take our stand and not run. Uh, Now, that's not going to be easy in the face of opposition and hostility when we actually are panicking and feel like we need to make a run for it. So here, Peter is telling us what we need to do together as a church in order to take our stand. And the first thing that will help us to take our stand is our leadership. Have a look at verses 1 and 2 of our passage today. To the elders among you... I appeal as a fellow elder and a witness of Christ's sufferings who will share in the glory to be revealed. Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, watching over them. Now, the elders here are not those people who are long in years, you know, with grey hair like myself. 
It's actually the elders are those who are responsible for leading and caring for the church. It's not uh, dissimilar to the elders that were in the synagogues in the first century. And here, Peter describes himself as a fellow elder. I think he's trying to give voice to his solidarity with these other leaders within the church. But I want to say to you this morning, I think it would be a mistake to think that being an elder is limited to those who simply have a formal paid leadership role within the church. So here at St Luke's, you might think, well, that, that would include myself and Ayres and Adam, at least, okay, uh, having that sort of paid leadership role to care for the church. I actually think we need to cast the net a lot wider. You see, this ought to include anyone who is responsible for the leading and caring of God's people here at St Luke's as well. And so that would include our small group leaders, wouldn't it? I mean, they have a responsibility to care uh, for the people that are in their groups. It'll include the leaders in our children's and youth ministries because they are looking after the young lives of our members here at St Luke's. So I think this passage, if you're a small group leader or involved in any sort of ministry where you're caring for and having responsibility for people here at St Luke's, this is a passage for you as well. But it's also a passage for all of us, because as we read this, it's actually going to shape our expectations of what we think leadership ought to be like. Now, of all the images that Peter could have used to describe the sort of leadership that he wants in the church, he uses the image of a shepherd. Now, just think for a moment the other sort of images that, uh, that Peter could have used. Peter could have said, you know, elders, you know, uh, be like a centurion who gives orders to his soldiers on the battlefield. I mean, that was a, an image that was available to him. He could have said, uh, elders, be like the emperor sitting on your throne, uh, you know, sort of unaware of where your people are at and what's going on in their lives. He could have said, elders, be like a master of slaves. But he doesn't, does he? They were all available to him, but the one that he goes for is that of a shepherd of God's flock that has been put under their care. Now, the role of a shepherd will entail a number of responsibilities. If you think about a shepherd for a moment and what they need to do for the flock, what do they need to do? Well, they need to guide the flock, don't they? As uh, he, he, the shepherd will sh seek to show them the way forward. Uh, the, the shepherd will guard the flock against the very real threats that might come and destroy them. The shepherd will then also feed the flock, won't he? He'll be trying to find good pastures for the sheep to eat and, and cool water to drink. And the other thing a shepherd will do is he'll gather the flock, won't he? Because when a sheep is alone, it's vulnerable. But when it's in the sheep fold, it's actually secure. So then the question becomes, well, how does an elder discharge this responsibility? I mean, how do I, as the senior minister of St Luke's, discharge this responsibility? Will guiding you mean that I will be giving you my 10 best tips on how not to feel overwhelmed with life? Will me guarding you as a flock Make, mean that I need to make sure that the site is secure every Sunday with all the gates and stuff locked up. Is that, is that what it means to be uh, guarding the flock? And then feeding the flock. Does that mean that I need to give you my wife Julie's tuna casserole recipe and then also the ingredients to make it, to feed you? And then gathering the flock. Does, does that mean that I'm supposed to be on the phone... Uh, ringing you up trying to find out why you weren't at church last Sunday. Is that what the role is like? Well, I want to say to you, the answer to each of those questions is a resounding no. Shepherding is primarily done through the ministry of God's word in a whole variety of contexts. Sometimes it happens from the pulpit, like now, but sometimes it will be happening in a person's home, Sometimes it'll be happening in a small group. Sometimes it'll be happening person to person over a coffee. For you see, the Bible alone is the thing that guides us. It is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Um, 
It is the scriptures that will guard us because it will teach us, rebuke us, correct us and train us in righteousness. And it is the word of God that will feed us because man does not live by bread alone, but by the very word from the mouth of God. And it is the word of God that gathers us, just as God gathered the nation of Israel at Mount Sinai in order to hear his voice. That is the first mention of the church in the, in the scriptures and the way that he gathers us today by his word. And it's this sort of shepherd that will help God's people stand. Peter then describes what a good church leader would look like and he uses sort of three contrasts in verses 2 to 3. Have a look at those verses with me. Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, watching over them, not because you must, but because you're willing, as God wants you to be, not pursuing dishonest gain, but eager to serve, not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. See, the, the elders in churches, they were not self-appointed. A person wouldn't come into the church and say, guess what, I'm your elder. No, elders were appointed within the church. And here Peter says <clears throat> that those who are appointed ought to do so willingly, that they haven't been forced into this role but rather that they are willing to serve in this role. And then Peter wants these leaders also to have a servant heart, that there is a willingness to be spent, for your life to be spent in the service of others, rather than having the sort of calculating heart that tries to imagine, what can I get out of this, out of this flock for myself? And then thirdly, Peter wants the leaders to be a model, uh, to model the example to those whom he, they are responsible for. You see, elders will help us to stand when they model the faith in the choices that they make and the things that they say and the things that they do. The shepherd is not to be a bully. The shepherd is not to be bossing around the sheep, expecting blind obedience to their vision of what, how things should be. You see, it's no small thing to engage in the task of shepherding God's people. And if you're involved in that, at times, you can be, begin to feel burdened by that responsibility. It's easy to start feeling discouraged with little recognition or thanks. And you can sort of be asking, the question, why am I doing this? Why am I stumping up again, leading a small group for another year? Well, look at what Peter says in verse 4. And when the chief shepherd appears, you'll receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. Here is a good reminder that every shepherd is accountable to the chief shepherd. But Peter writes this as not as a threat, but as an encouragement to us. He reminds the shepherds who they are doing this for. That we're doing it for Jesus so that Jesus' sheep will be able to stand rather than flee and fall away. And the crown of glory may well be the words, well done, good and faithful servant. Uh, every five years, uh, the National Church Survey is uh, conducted. And I'm sure many of you might have been here when we conducted it in 2016. Uh, when the National Church, so Church Life Survey operates, they're trying to measure nine core qualities of a church through that questionnaire. And one of the core qualities that they try to measure is leadership within the church. Now, I have a bit of a confession to make to you this morning. This is the core quality that is ranked last here at St Luke's every time we do it. Of all the core qualities here at St Luke's, leadership ranks last. And uh, needless to say, over the years, I've found that a little bit discouraging. But I want to read to you how they actually describe Christian leadership and empowering leaders, what they're trying to measure for. This is it. 
Christian leadership strives to inspire and empower, requiring a balance of moving forward with vision as well as encouraging other people's gifts. Inspiring leaders can move people towards action. Empowering leaders will help people find their place uh, as the part of the body of Christ. These leaders offer a sense of direction, inspiring and encouraging people to join together to make a difference. Now, I'm not quite sure who put that together, but it seems to me at least that it doesn't seem to sit easily, at least with what Peter is saying in this passage about the sort of leadership that is needed for us to take our stand as outsiders in this fallen and broken world. But just in case you're here and you've been here for many years and you're wondering, where is St Luke's going? What, you know, what are we supposed to be as a church here? Well, I want to share with you uh, what our mission here at St Luke's is. What is it that we ought to do? This is our mission. It's up on the screen. Our mission at St Luke's is to see the lost saved by Christ and to see the saved live for Christ. That's our mission. Okay? And if you're wondering what we ought to be as a church, what is our, the vision that we hope to have of ourselves, well, here it is. To be a united community of Jesus' disciples who, who love God, seen in our obedience to his word, who love the church, seen in our service of each other, and who love the lost as we seek to share the gospel with them. Now, we've had that mission statement and vision statement for many, many years, and it may seem hardly new or exciting. It might seem hardly the sort of thing that you want to invest your time and your energy and your finances into support. Some might even describe it as business as usual. But I want to say to you that it actually comes from Jesus himself. It emerges out of the Great Commission to go and make disciples of all nations. And it also comes out of Jesus' great command to love God and to love your neighbour. I think if we're doing these things, we're doing okay. What more could we possibly need to throw our time and our energy and our financial support behind? Surely this is worth it. Well, the next instruction in our passage today, actually, uh, that Peter gives us if we want to make our stand is really sort of the flip side of the leadership issue that was discussed in verses 1 to 4. And here it's trying to deal with our attitude uh, to our life together, and in particular, the cardinal Christian virtue of humility. Look at verse 5. In the same way, you who are younger... Submit yourselves to your elders. All of you, clothe yourselves with humility towards one another because God opposes the proud but shows favour to the humble. Now here, as Peter addresses uh, you who are younger, he may simply be referring to those who are young. Uh, that no longer includes me, okay? Apparently... Uh, uh, in, in about the second century, you know, if you had grey hair, you're supposed to be in your 70s. So I'm nowhere near 70. But anyway, he may be referring to the young, but, and he might be referring to the young because sometimes the young can be impatient with the elders, can't they? You know, the young people can be, uh, they're impatient because the elders seem to be having this sort of more measured approach to ministry in the midst of a hostile opposition. But it may also be that the younger here is a way of referring to those who are not elders. Okay? So it's addressing everybody who's not an elder. And did you notice that it is not the elder's job to demand submission from those who've been entrusted to him? I mean, back in verse 3, it says that the shepherd should not lord it over those entrusted to them already. Submission is given to the elder. It is not demanded by the elder. The elder is there to help us stand firm. And I think what Peter wants is to try and make that task easier for them, not harder. Then did you notice that 
Everybody is, com- is addressed in that command to clothe yourself hu- with humility. It's not just speaking to a particular group. He's actually now addressing everybody. Clothe yourself with humility because God opposes the proud and shows favour to the humble. Now, probably a good way of thinking about humility is that humility is not thinking less about yourself. Humility is actually about thinking more about others. I think that's a helpful way of thinking about humility. It's not thinking less about yourself. It's actually thinking more about others. And, uh, and we're to clothe ourselves with this humility. And the image that Peter is using here is that of the, an apron that a slave would wear, wrapping it around over your clothes in order to serve. And then Peter gives a reason why we ought to clothe ourselves with humility. The reason comes from Proverbs chapter 3, verse 34. Look at it in our passage. It says, God opposes the proud but shows favour to the humble. So if we're proud in terms of our relationships with one another, God's going to oppose us. And if God is opposing us, it can't mean it's going to be easy for us to stand. But if we are humble, then we will know God's favour. And if we're going to know God's favour, then it will be easy for us to stand when the tough days come. And if we humble ourselves before God, he will promise and help us to stand. Look at verses 6 and 7. It says, Humble yourselves therefore under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. See, casting our anxiety on God is an admission, isn't it? It's an admission that is actually hard to stand firm in the face of hostility and opposition. The easiest thing to do, you know, if we're threatened sometimes, is to try and attack the opposition. Or if we're facing opposition and persecution, we might even rage against God, asking, why are you, do- why are you allowing this to happen to me? But here we're to call on God, knowing that he gives grace to the humble so that we can stand You see, God is thoroughly committed to helping us make our stand because there is one who cares nothing for our well-being. There is one who will do whatever it takes to undermine our commitment to God. Look at verses 8 and 9. Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. See, here, Peter unmasks the one who is at work in the world in the midst of hostility and opposition. His goal is that we'll give up on Jesus and walk away from him. And the moment that we walk away from Jesus is the moment that we are devoured. You know, the fact that our life may not be all that we'd hoped for does not mean that the devil has won. The fact that our nation seems to be drifting further and further away from its Christian heritage does not mean that the devil has won. And when you face broken relationships and feel abandoned because of your faith, that does not mean that the devil has won. The devil only scores a win if any of those things gives us cause to give up on Jesus and walk away. That is why Peter says, resist him. Together, As brothers and sisters in Christ, in the midst of any opposition or hostility that might come our way, we stand firm, knowing that we have a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. We know that we have an inheritance kept in heaven that can never perish, spoil or fade. We know that we are shielded by God's power until the return of Christ. 
We know that our present sufferings are here to strengthen and refine our faith that is precious to God. We know that we've been redeemed from an empty way of life by the precious blood of Jesus. We know that Christ has suffered for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. We know that Christ has suffered and left us an example to follow. We know that if we suffer for doing good, that we will be blessed by God. We know that if we share in Christ's suffering now, then we will share in Christ's glory when he returns. Friends, this is the ground on which we can stand and resist the devil. While he is a real enemy to God's people, we also ought to remember he's a defeated enemy. So the question is, will you stand? For those of us who are Christians here this morning, I'm sure that is our hope. That when the tough days do come, that we won't lose our nerve. But maybe there's also a little bit of uncertainty. If it got really, really bad, would you give up? Now at this point, I wanted to tell you about Archbishop Cramner during the English Reformation. Uh, He was a man who did lose his nerve during the Reformation, when Queen Mary came to the throne. uh, But he did recover and he did stand firm when he died as a martyr. Uh, The other people I would have liked to have told you about is two other English bishops, Hugh Latimer and Nicholas Ridley. Neither of these men lost their nerve when they are burnt at the stake together as martyrs under the reign of Queen Mary. I could have told you about these guys, but I actually want to tell you about a church that presently meets in the United States. It's an Anglican church. It's the Anglican congregation of Falls Church, Virginia. Falls Church, the Anglican church there is actually the church that George Washington used to worship at, okay? So it's a very, very old church. Well, In 2006, this church took a stand for the authority of Scripture. The Episcopal Church of America had ordained an openly practising homosexual bishop. And so the 4,000 members of this church voted to break away from the denomination. Why? Because they believed in the authority of God's word. They decided that they wanted to align themselves to a more biblically conservative branch of the worldwide Anglican Church. They did not give up being part of the Anglican denomination. They were just realigning themselves with people who held to the authority of Scripture. They did not cease to be an Anglican Church. But the Episcopal Church of America took this congregation of Falls Church to court And the $26 million historic church and buildings and property was seized by the denomination from the church that gathered there. Not only that, they also seized the church Bibles, they seized the rectory that housed the minister, and they also seized every cent that was in the church bank account, and then a locksmith was brought in to change all the locks on the church building. Now, Falls Church is one of hundreds of congregations across the United States that have given up their buildings rather than stay affiliated with a branch of their denomination that denies the final authority of Scripture. Uh, Laura Smithhurst, who was a member of that congregation at that time, said this, One blessing from this is the opportunity to become more like Jesus during all of this. Right now, We don't know the future more than a few months down the road. But we do know that God will take care of us and greatly desires us to grow in holiness and in Christ-like character through all of it. Isn't that remarkable? They've had everything taken from them and that's their response. 
it is possible to stand together, to stand our ground, even when the enemy is dressed in bishop's clothes. But we need to remember that when we take our stand, we are not on our own. We actually have the promise that God is with us, and there it is in verse 10. And the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm and steadfast. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. Well, friends, we've come to the end of this challenging letter of 1 Peter. It's a letter that has offered help as we live for our Saviour and King, in whom there is no other source of grace, forgiveness and eternal life. It is a letter that is helping us as we find ourselves as outsiders in this fallen and broken world. So... As let me finish with Peter's closing words to us in verse 12. And as this is the final time that I'll be preaching to you over the next five weeks when I'm on long service leave, please listen to this. Peter's words in verse 12 I have written to you briefly, encouraging you and testifying that this is the true grace of God. Stand fast in it. Let's pray. Our gracious God and Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your servant Peter, uh, that he was a man who knew what it was like to lose his nerve when Jesus was on trial and denied him three times. Thank you for the way that you restored your servant Peter, for the forgiveness of sins that we have in your name. Thank you for this letter that he wrote to the churches. And we pray and we thank you for it is a letter for us as well. We do pray, Heavenly Father, that we would heed Peter's advice, that as we've looked to his word, we've been encouraged and that we would indeed stand fast in the true grace of God. Heavenly Father, if hard days come upon us, we do pray that as a church here at St Luke's, that we would indeed stand our ground and be ready to suffer for the cause of the gospel. And this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.